Hi there. Have you ever wondered what it's like on the inside of a humanitarian response? Since fighting broke out in Sudan around two months ago in mid-April, over a million people have been displaced. It's an all too familiar story of conflict survival, a migration shockwave, and huge vulnerability for mothers and children especially. I'm Phil Johnstone, visiting East Africa to help World Vision communicate this crisis globally. Do join me as I visit refugee camps and meet displaced people and the humanitarians working to support them. First stop, Nairobi. It's mid-May. I record a message for World Vision staff around the world by a manager who got out of Sudan just before the fighting began. My name is Basil Mwakulomba. I've been leading the East Darfur program in World Vision Sudan. I come to you just to share in solidarity that this is the time we need to stand by each other. Sudan has been going through a difficult moment. The war has ravaged the country. People have been displaced. Our staff are in risky environments. Engaging with them, they just show you how much the things are tough. I have left my team there and it pains me to know that I can be helpless. But I believe when we come together to pray, we can be able to make a difference where we can encourage our staff, if you know any staff in Sudan, reaching out, sending them a text, it may arrive after two days, but it may make a big difference that they may know there are people in the partnership who are saying we are standing together with Sudan. More than 260 World Vision staff in Sudan are sheltering in place. Their work is suspended till it's safe to operate. And amongst the fighting, there's looting and general lawlessness. Response agencies can't get visas for Sudan, so I'm sent to the country of South Sudan, where more than 70,000 people have crossed in recent weeks. Sharing a ride from the airport to the capital city of Juba, a local staffer shares how he's helping colleagues in Sudan. You hold the mic there, just, and talk to it. Hello, my name is Humphrey Mukutuma. I'm the finance director for World Vision South Sudan. Uh, the past couple of weeks, we have been uh, trying to pay salaries for the staff that are scattered around the country, running away from the war. Um, it's been a struggle, but uh, eventually we managed to pay them for last month. Um, it wasn't easy. Um, Every, most of them have been paid, but there are some who can be traced. Um, and so it's been uh, difficult to find them and pay them their salaries. Uh, we've, we've, uh, we've passionately been pursuing this because the inflation is really going high. And the earlier they have their monies and get some supplies for their households, the better. Some of them are really hard to uh, pass through very uh, dangerous uh, ways just to get their money. Uh, and then some of them, uh, f uh, our bank there, fortunately, was able to reach out, find them where they are, and be able to pay them. Uh, but most of, uh, but a few of them, it's just been impossible to find them. Arriving at the World Vision offices a day later, it's a real treat to enjoy a musical start to the Monday morning staff meeting. so good to take a moment ahead of visiting border regions this week where thousands of people are in need of help. I'm in the World Vision South Sudan offices. I'm here with Samanga. What's your role with this response, Samanga? My, my major role in this response is to coordinate the, the Sudan response within the South Sudan office, looking at uh, Upper Nile and also the Northern Barakazal, where you'll be going tomorrow. What's going on up there? What am I going to see when, I, when we go there tomorrow? When you get there, the situation is very dire. A lot of people are in need. We have uh, returnees and refugees that are crossing in through the northern Barakazal borders. So in one of the camps, there's almost a thousand people who are in need of uh, health, nutrition and uh, wash services. 
you you are going to see a lot of work that World Vision is doing. We are involved in coordination with all the clusters, uh, protection cluster, health cluster, to see how the people can be supported. Currently, we are working on a response to see how we can continue to make their lives better. Big numbers of people. I mean, you must prepare plans for this sort of stuff, but it's actually happening. Yes, we actually have a national office response plan, but because the situation continues to evolve every day, you find that we are continuing to adapt and to change the program, the plan, so that it is able to suit the needs on the, of the people on the ground. There's a lot of things changing every day. Any tips for me when I get up there? What should I, uh, what should I be doing to keep safe? Is it a dangerous area to be in or not really? Uh, Northern Bagrazal is generally a very safe and a quiet place, but because of the challenges that we have when people cross the border and they have nothing, so you just need to be careful in terms of, of your own personal safety. But otherwise, generally, on a good day, it's a safe place. On behalf of ONHA 748 Air Services, Captain Obok and the entire team, we would like to welcome you on board our Dash 8 Aircraft 100 Series, shortly departing for WOW via Awil. I'm on a UN flight with Scovia Charles, a former Ugandan child refugee. She's a smart young communicator with World Vision South Sudan. Just under 40 humanitarians from a variety of NGOs and UN agencies are packed onto this flight. We're heading north towards the border. Heavy rain, big storm coming through, mid-afternoon, lightning, thunder. Great weather for bringing moisture to people's gardens, their vegetables, but not so great at all for people, the refugees and the returnees in their temporary camps, trying to shelter uh, as best they can uh, while all this is kicking in. We're gonna get a briefing from the project manager shortly, and then uh, we'll be all ready to go to the reception areas uh, tomorrow and Thursday. Okay, uh, my name is Garang Gyaldeo. I'm an interim area program manager for World Vision, uh, based in Northern Barkazal uh, State. We are now uh, going from Awil Town to Wedwil, which is a transit camp designed to receive Sudanese refugees and returnees. There we will expect uh, to see uh, returnees and refugees. Returnees are over 3,000 individuals. Uh, refugees are around 600 to 800. I'm saying this because we are receiving them continuously. I don't have yesterday update, but as we'll be on the ground, we'll be able to have the full update. The transit camp is large. A few days ago, World Vision gave refugee family groups a kit of non-food items such as sleeping mats, cooking utensils, mosquito nets, blankets, a water container, soap, sanitary products and solar lamps. Our staff are also tracking people movements over the border, registering returnees, plus providing water and sanitation health assistance, emergency nutrition and food. It's hot around 35 degrees Celsius. We head out to take photos and record video reports. Hi, I'm Scovia. I'm here with the World Vision team at the South Sudan Refugees Transit Center, where the Sudanese refugees are situated right now. 
Behind me are refugee women setting up uh, uh, shelters. And also on my right hand are refugee women sitting under the tree where they sleep and stay. So most of these refugees are actually women and children. And uh, World Vision and other agencies are responding to their needs, with World Vision responding with non-food items and then other agencies responding with hot meals and all that. As much as we have done this, there's still a lot of need on ground. and. We call on all supporters, everybody out there, to be able to see these needs and respond to the, the, to the refugees. Thank you. I'm Phil Johnson. I'm here in a transit camp near the border between South Sudan and Sudan. People have come here, sometimes walking for weeks, treacherous times, lots of dangers on the way to escape fighting and looting and all sorts of bad stuff. And now they're at the transit camp and they wait gather under trees, it's very hot here, they have basic needs met. And in a few days, the plan is the government will have ready a much better uh, place for them to go, a, a well-equipped refugee camp with good tents and uh, water and sanitation. So they will have come from a very dangerous situation to the discomfort they are in now, to a point of actually having some peace and security and then planning the ne next step. World Vision is here, collaborating and partnering well with other agencies. If you would like to be part of this, bringing hope and actual help for people, then please donate. Visit the World Vision website in your country, be part of change and be part of this work that's happening today. Thank you. On the drive back, we chat with Maria Deng, an impressive local program officer for World Vision South Sudan, who has translated for us and been an invaluable advisor. Thanks for putting up with us. Scobie, we've made it hard, haven't we? We've kept asking her to do things again and differently. <laughs> Two days of, can you do this again? Can you do that again? Um, I think Maria has really been so supportive. We really appreciate. And also, thank you for being patient with us, by the way. We always want to put something out there, but we want to put something out there that is really good. You know that will be appreciated by everybody. So thank you. Yeah, and <laughs> you say nice things about comms people, but... You know, we look at program people like you and disaster response people, emergency people. You're on the ground every day. You're living here. You know, you are the heroes too, very much. Much more than comms people, yeah. I'd say. Yeah, thank you. Make you make things happen. Thank you really you. make things yeah, happen on you're, ground. You're, you're, you're doing change on the ground. Yeah, you? thank you. I'm really very happy. That statement motivates me. I will do better than this. Thank you. <laughs> so, Maria, are there many people who work for World Vision who have been refugees themselves? Yeah, uh, take example, uh, me, I was a refugee, and then uh, Andrew Ajo, he was also in Sudan as a refugee, uh, and then uh, uh, this lady, she was also a refugee, so we are many, and we are, really we are very happy to support uh, Sudanese people. We feel like we know their culture, we know, we feel like we are the same, we are feeling the same pain, so we are really very happy. Uh, to reward them also. So you remember the feeling of being a refugee? Yes, I was a refugee in Sudan during the war time uh, between Sudan and South Sudan. I was in Sudan, Sudan was my refugee. I, re I, I get my education there until I completed my education. Uh, today I'm working as a humanitarian worker, so it is the highest chance for me to support uh, Sudanese refugees in South Sudan so that I can reward them. This is what I can do. There's a lot of refugees in the world, aren't there? Yeah, there is a lot of refugees in the world, actually. Being a refugee, uh, sometimes is very difficult, but if you cope with situation, you can uh, also uh, support others in future, like I'm doing now. Yeah. We're driving back to our wheel airport. Lunchtime on Friday, after two very busy hot days. Scovia, what was uh, lasting memories for you? Well, like you said, uh, two busy days. We got to meet um, refugee mothers, children who are displaced from Sudan by the conflict. And uh, what is still in my mind, like the whole night, I kept thinking about was the story of the mother of eight, Saura, um, having seen your husband dead. And then you taking care of eight children in this difficult situation away from your home. It's actually something that is so difficult. It's something that a lot of women got to go through. 
but it's not anything that anyone would wish for anyone to like for any other person you know having um going through this i don't think um it will be easy for me to let go of it easily like uh you know to to keep in my mind of course because i really feel her pain thanks two things for me one was uh, the transit camp refugees and returnees the waiting after this long trip perilous trip then our waiting in the hot sun under little shrubs hopefully in a few days or maybe a week or two moving to a, a properly set up refugee shelter and then secondly perhaps the strongest uh, impact on me was um, hearing andrew a world vision staff one of the first faces people see when they come across the border from sudan into south sudan he's recording the numbers of people and uh, getting the details ready so they will get support and he described how people had told him that just in the last hour or so of coming to the border there are a series of about five checkpoints by local militia people with guns uh, demanding in turn money or well, if you haven't got money what else have you got uh, what a horrendous situation for people after perhaps weeks of walking traveling being fearful traveling light looking for safety and now there's this gut-wrenching hurdle in front of them one by one they have to go through about a mile apart and we heard about a woman who was stabbed we saw photos of her her wounds and uh, and stories of torture as well so you know it breaks your heart really doesn't it to hear that kind of uh, situation uh, for refugees and returnees This is a Dash 8 Series 100. We are departing now on flight United Nations 090H. Our mission today is to get you across to Malakal. And I know for some of you who are proceeding further afield into rank. Uh, you know okay, Scovia. We're in Malakal. First thing I noticed here at the airport are some UN peacekeepers. What's, what's that about? Um, well, they are... UN peacekeepers in Malakau since uh, 2013 because of the conflict of course and uh, there's a very big uh, protection of civilian site which is a camp harboring over 30,000 people so the peacekeepers are obviously here to peace like to keep peace right and to protect the people because uh, there are still those grudges of people living in town uh, cannot come to the POC, and people living in the POC cannot come to the town because... So the POC is a, is a, is a refugee camp? Yeah, it's a refugee camp. My name is uh, Patrick uh, Mogalula, and I'm commonly known as Paddy here, and I'm the Zonal Program Manager for World Vision in, in Apanai uh, Zone. And how long have you been here? I've been here about eight months now, yeah. How do you describe this compound to people who've never been here before? Well, this is a, a beautiful compound that puts uh, all humanitarians in just one place. So every, all, all organizations, UN and international NGO staff all live in one, one compound. So uh, it's very easy to connect, to co collaborate. Uh, I don't need to make appointments. I just walk to your office or to your accommodation. So it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a good place. It's very big. I mean, is it, is it half a mile square or...? Yeah, maybe more than that. Um, it's, it's, it's quite big, yes. It's really, I understand this is probably the biggest hub in, in, in the world right now. Armoured vehicles, huge tankers, gas tankers. I've noticed there are well-fortified bunkers regularly throughout. What's that about? Well, so I, I, I guess, uh, firstly, uh, we, we, we can only provide resp support to the, the people that are in need if we are safe and, uh, and, and, and alive. And the, the risk uh, here uh, is, is still high. 
uh, potential risk for attacks and, and, and things like that. So this is an effort in keeping humanitarians really safe in the event of any external ag- aggression. So there are tribal fights from time to time, but would they want to attack the humanitarian organisations as well? No, uh, thankfully no. These uh, tribal attacks are basically tribal attacks. They try to keep a humanitarian uh, uh, community away from it, except, of course, for the local humanitarian staff that are part of these tribes. They, they would be, their lives would be endangered if that would happen. Have you ever felt unsafe in the eight months that you have been here? I have. I have, especially while out there in the field, maybe travelling along the River Nile from one location to another, and you're going through uh, military checkpoints, and some held by government and others held by other groups. It's, it can feel quite unsafe sometimes. Why do you do the work that you do? Ah, I, I guess it's a calling. <laughs> yeah, it's... Um, it's 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 a it's it's very rewarding uh, being in a place like this and and serving people that are in need and and seeing how your work impacts them. You you know you you see it. You see the change. You, and and and, and I, there's nothing more rewarding than that. What would you say to a World Vision supporter on the other side of the world? Might give some money for your work or for the Sudan response. Uh, what would you say to them? I would say thank you, because because of their generosity um, and all the support that they, they provide, we as World Vision are able to to reach out and and respond and provide uh, assistance to children and their communities that are highly distressed because of the conflict. People are able to find food or to get the shelters or for children to to, to go to school. And, and basically to provide hope, uh, because this, this is really a very uh, a hopeless situation. And uh, because we are here, people have hope. And I think uh, it's, it's a noble uh, cause that the, our donors and supporters are contributing to. What's the impact of that here uh, in Malakal? Well, it's, it's, it's huge. Um, even before this uh, displacement, um, the situation in Malakal was really bad because we, have, we had over 30,000 or more people I- inside the uh, POC here who are displaced by conflict, and we have other thousands in different uh, IDP camps uh, around them. So services were already being stretched. You know, water is not enough, food is not enough, and... and and, and resources are inadequate, obviously. So this was already a, a, a difficult situation, and the arrival of thousands now um, already adds the pressure to you know what was already minimal uh, services. So uh, it's it's a good thing that they have a home to come to, and and maybe this could be a, a beginning to to people settling and getting back to their lives and and starting their lives afresh. But obviously the need is huge because um, the resources have already been used in many responses and certainly we'll need a lot of assistance to support them right now. So it's Thursday, our last day in the field together. Scovia, what are we going to see today? Well, um, today is just about uh, World Vision's response for the returnees in Malakau. So we'll be looking at uh, ve- like verification of uh, beneficiaries. We'll also be seeing food assistance. We'll also go to a couple of areas where water is uh, given to the people. So it's going to be a beautiful day. We see impressive teamwork and partnership. Around a dozen local staff calmly manage more than 1,500 people who have come to receive food. It's a partnership with the World Food Programme. We interview returnees, take photos and create video clips to describe what's happening. To escape the violence in Sudan, more than 350,000 people in recent weeks have crossed the border into neighbouring countries. World Vision is on the ground. We're active. Here in Malakau in South Sudan, it's a special day, Food Distribution Day. People are vetted here, their cars are checked, they're verified, then they move to another part of the site where they can collect rice, cooking oil, and for those who need it, nutritional supplements for infants. I'm here again with Patty. 
We're at the transit camp. Half past three in the afternoon. Been a good day. What's happened today, Patty? Oh, well, Phil, we, we just had a very successful day today. We distributed food to over 1,500 uh, South Sudanese returnees here in Malakal. And, um, and, and, and that's a 15th day's ration uh, for, for those people. Uh, but also, uh, our teams have been here on, at the transit uh, center, and sh- you know, trying to pump water to make sure people have a uh, clean uh, supply, of, uh, supply of clean water here at the transit center. We have roughly at any one moment over 4,000, between four to 6,000 people here at the uh, re- reception center. Um, yeah, so um, life continues uh, here. World Vision supplies the water to the town. Yeah, we suck it out of the Nile, clean it up and distribute it. And then when this centre opened up, we quickly came in here. What was involved in that? Well, yeah, it, it was quite some difficult. Uh, it was quite difficult in the beginning because we uh, we take some of our technicians who know the pipelines in Malakal were not around, so we were really grappling with it. We almost set up a whole new system. Uh, but then our technicians came up and so it was easy. They knew where the pipelines pass and so we easily tap through existing a uh, pipe that supplies the other locations in Malacca. People were going down to the Nile to oh, the yes. bathroom and then taking water from there. Oh yes, and beginning there was no water here, so people were going to the to the Nile and just taking water and of course that that was a recipe for disaster. We we've just come out of a cholera situation here. So this has made a big difference, you know, being able to access, you know, clean and, and safe water for drinking is is a huge is huge huge, huge And relief. 16 latrines as well I hear. Yes, and six, 16 new latrines that we've just uh, constructed but also another six that we rehabilitated. So that would be about 24 uh, latrines that now they are using. So this centre, you told me it's a former police academy, yeah. training centre, yeah. decrepit buildings, some tents. Paint a picture. What, what are you seeing as you look out here? Well, th- th- this is a former police uh, training uh, centre, but it's a, it has a few dilapidated uh, buildings, uh, a nice uh, old uh, government hotel called Nile Palace that just collapsed or be- because of the war. Uh, it's basically a few structures. So people are just, you know, around the, the camp because there's no enough, enough shelter. They are seated in groups of families and uh, trees in the open, open space in the hot sun. And, 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 and this is partly because this is temporary tra- transit centre and the government hopes that they can move out in less than 15 days. So they find out where people want to go. Some, many of these are returnees. Perhaps they left 10 years ago because of conflict here and now they're coming back the second time. And so they'll generally want to go back to where they came from, yeah, from their home state. That's correct. Uh, some of them are people who flee, fled from Malacca uh, during the war and now they are back and we, we basically, they come to the tra- temporal centre for a few days bef- and then they get resettled in their communities. Most of them come from other parts of Upper Nile and also other states and so the, the issue really here is organising transportation for their further uh, movement. What a, what a tough life. It's not what you'd want for anyone to be a refugee, to cross a border once and then to come and do it again a decade later. And that is, how do people cope with that? No, it's a, it's, it's a very, very uh, difficult uh, situation. I can't Im- imagine my, myself or my family going through a, a, a situation like this. You, you would m- probably think that, ah, oh, they are now used, they are hardened, but no, they are not. They, they are hopeless, they are... Uh, frustrated and they are really, really disturbed and and, and I think it's, it's our prayer, all of us, that this situation ends soon and people can resettle and go back to their former lives soon. Walking through the camp, we strike up a conversation with a returnee called Mario. How are you coping with the, the stress and the tiredness? And the... I, uh, maybe... When I talk you, when I talk to you, when I tell you, me, I'm talking Arabic, but my English very little. 
can you talk to by this guy and okay. sure uh, okay yeah, uh, i am impressed with your english <laughs> i am impressed with your english and i understand everything you say but yeah. i appreciate that yeah yeah, yeah we'll so my, my last good question so was, anyway. yeah, my yeah, last question was yeah. how is he coping with all this just personally yeah والله انا غايتو متعود يعني حاجات ده في سو السودان في حاجات كتير انا شوفنا حاجات اكبر من كده ها عشان كده بندعمو الماو شنو ستيب باي ستيب لو زول بيجي يعمل اكثر من راسه ممكن يجن ها ممكن يفقد لكن بنحاول شنو نساوي الموضوع لانه ده حاجه اصلا ما بتنتهي ده حاجه في موجود في العالم كله yeah he has experienced uh, all challenges uh, since some years back uh, there is a complaint in south sudan everywhere and every time so for him it's not a shock because it's something that happening and if uh, he did not manage it well it can uh, uh, cause problem for him so he's trying to manage it step by step slowly slowly uh, so he can cope with the situation please say a big thank you for his time yeah shukran le zaman bitak okay Thank him for I you. Appreciate it, man. Okay. Yeah. Oh, your name who? Phil. 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 Okay. We we hope to see you and burnt you. Right. Uh, well, I would love that too. Okay. Okay. Okay, okay. guys. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. What's happening, Freddy? Well, it's, we, it's raining. Uh, I believe the the rain seasons have just started in Malta. Yeah, and that's quite a dramatic rain season, is it? Oh yes, uh, we we all love rain, but uh, it's a different kind of situation when it rains in Upper Nile. Um, the, the Nile usually uh, breaks its banks, and and there's lots of flooding and. and people get displaced from their homes and yeah so it's a uh, uh, good but not good at the same time yeah. and the rain season has been delayed yeah it's later than usual yes it's it's been delayed we, we believe it's part of the well global warming effect so we we hope maybe the rains won't be too long It's time to leave Malakal. A 90-minute flight back to Juba, where I put in a Teams call to get the big picture from World Vision's Sudan Crisis Response Chief. Yeah, my name is Jeff Wright. I'm a humanitarian response director with World Vision International. I've been in the humanitarian world for uh, about 30 years. My first relief response was in 1991 and I've done this kind of work pretty much continuously since then. I've been with World Vision since 2007 always part of their humanitarian team uh, in different capacities but always part of the humanitarian team. And so how quickly did World Vision respond to the crisis in Sudan? Yeah, it took about two weeks actually. Uh the conflict kind of kicked off uh, on about April 15. and uh, it was may 2 when world vision finally uh, decided to declare a humanitarian emergency a humanitarian response um to sudan i think most agencies were in a similar space um everyone kind of stunned by i think how quickly and how kind of overwhelmingly this conflict uh, took over the country everyone frantically trying to shore up their their property and their their assets get their internationals out of the country in many cases and so yeah i think everybody uh was kind of taken aback by how this evolved so you get a call you jump on a plane here we go again and you assemble a team who are the what are the different roles you look to to get together quickly yeah that's pretty much it um you know i got a call on uh Tuesday morning and I was on a on on a plane by Wednesday. Um typically on my team the standard is uh we're ready to travel within 72 hours of being called or on the ground within 72 hours of being called and yeah this was one of those cases where that was pretty much the case. Um in terms of the team that I uh put together 
you know, some of the some of the first roles that I look to fill are are finance and and human resources. Actually, um, the ability to to manage and account for money because that's a a real big part of the responsibility on a on a res- response like this, and then the ability to to hire good people, um, whether that's internal secondments and deployments or whether that's hiring new from outside, but at any rate, uh, the ability to yeah, manage money and manage people. Those are real key things to get get right right out out of the gate. So we got security. We got some communications. What are the other roles then? Uh, yep. Uh, so so security for sure. Somebody who's got the ability to analyze the situation on the ground, whether that's directly on the ground or f- from afar via, you know, information that we're able to get through the news media and from from our our, our staff on the ground. Um, communication certainly is a huge part of it as well. Uh, people who can take pictures and video and put it together and designers who can can make it look good for a website. All those kinds of things are hugely important. After that, uh, then we're talking about logistics. Uh, somebody who knows how to move large amounts of stuff from point A to point B and deal with customs clearance and airlines and permission to travel and, and things like that. Uh, and then then we're talking about grant acquisition and uh, technical sectors. So somebody who's good at writing proposals, I often have input on, on that process as well. Um, uh, yeah, grant proposals that get money from uh, donors of, of various kinds that support World Vision's work. Humanitarian response runs on money and we need it to run. So. There's that. Uh, and then when we talk about technical sectors, I mean things like experts in water, sanitation, and hygiene. That's usually a, a huge need uh, in refugee and internal displacement kinds of situations. People who are very good at uh, working with food commodities and food logistics, people who are very good at humanitarian and child protection and understand the issues that refugees face when they cross the border from their home country into a new country. and. Uh, who are well versed in the kinds of vulnerabilities that those people often have. So, what's World Vision been able to do in the seven weeks or so since the crisis began? Well, since the crisis started, since we initiated our relief response, uh, we have now been able to respond in some way in all of the five countries affected by the crisis where we are also working. Those countries being Sudan itself, obviously, Chad, Central African Republic, Ethiopia, and South Sudan. Now, what that response looks like does vary a bit from place to place. In Central African Republic, for example, uh, the refugees are crossing in into a, an area that's very difficult for us to access. And so our response is uh, a, a bit scaled back, uh, providing shelter kinds of things, mosquito nets so people don't get malaria, uh, et cetera. In Chad, uh, we're looking at a more robust response and that, that will it come to include food distribution, uh, when we get there, also uh, basic household items so that refugees have things that they need to cook food, to carry and store water, uh, sleeping mats, uh, tents, things like that. <clears throat> Inside Sudan itself, we're now beginning our fourth week of continuous food distribution in the southern part of the country, mainly in the state of South Kordofan. Also looking at uh, trying to start in the next day or two in Blue Nile State. You were keen to get into Sudan, but you haven't been able to. Why not? And is that frustrating? (laughs) Yeah, it's absolutely frustrating. Uh, There are a number of challenges with getting into Sudan at the moment. Uh, Perhaps the very number one challenge is is around visas uh, for a range of reasons, um, many of which are quite understandable. I think it's very difficult to get a visa to Sudan at this time. Uh, there are reports of of some humanitarians, mainly inside the UN system, who have managed it, uh, but it's it seems to be really hit and miss. And so far, neither myself nor anyone on uh, on my team in World Vision have been able to do it. You know, there there's a transportation barrier as well. Uh, you know, the UN is ready to to fly planes to Port Sudan, but uh, there's just a ton of bureaucratic obstacles permission to take off, permission to use airspace, permission to land, all of those things uh, seem to have to be renegotiated on a on an almost daily basis. And then I guess even once we get into Sudan, just the ability to move from one place to another also is extremely 
kind of iffy at this point. It's not at all. Um, it, it, it's, it's impossible to say reliably today that we can go from point A to point B. Uh, and then once we get to point B that we can actually do the thing we want to do. So while it is frustrating, uh, I think we all understand that um, it is a, a very difficult and, and also dangerous uh, situation in Sudan at this time. And it's likely to stay that way for quite a while, uh, which means for us that then in the meantime, we're kind of operating remotely, sending in uh, supplies and, and in-kind assistance where we can. And that also is is rather day-to-day. -day. Uh, but I think the real the real uh, focus and, and the real kind of applause, I guess, goes to our staff on the ground in Sudan, Sudanese staff who, who've worked for Rural Vision before the conflict and who are now carrying out our work um, in what's got to be incredibly scary and dangerous uh, times. Finally, Jeff, yeah, this work can be dangerous and it's certainly tiring. Uh, what's your motivation to do it? Well, yeah, you're 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 right. It 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 is often dangerous and and certainly tiring. I think that uh, if if we're here on this uh, on this planet and we see our fellow humans suffering and we don't do anything, then 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 what are we really? Uh, you can go on YouTube and see elephants helping each other out of ditches. You can see ants uh, helping their community cross water. Uh, there's no reason for us to turn away, and I personally don't feel that I can turn away when I see uh, my fellow humans suffering in, in places like Sudan. Well said. Well, thanks everyone for coming on this podcast journey with me over these last two or three weeks. I hope you've enjoyed having a slice of what a response is like. And for more information about the situation in Sudan and neighboring countries, do check out the World Vision website for your country. And uh, listen, if you'd like to lend a hand, please donate. We know that your money will make a real difference. Thank you. This World Vision documentary was edited by JD Lowe at Fratelli Media. Incidental music by Miller Yule. Produced and voiced by Phil Johnstone.